Okay, well, it's six o'clock and it's Wednesday the 16th of June, so this must be UCM Talks, and it's actually our last one for the 22-23 series. Um, um, it's our fifth series, and um, most of this this year when we've been having talks, I've been grateful it's online because of the bad weather, but tonight it's actually the complete opposite. But please stay on and enjoy this talk. There's at least three hours of daylight and sunshine to, to, to enjoy at seven o'clock when we finish. Um, it, it gives me great pleasure to, to introduce one of our UCM honorary fellows, Dr. Rachel Glover. Rachel uh, was appointed an honorary fellow in 2019, which recognizes her contributions to the, the vision of UCM and it's something she's continued to do since, 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 that, since that appointment. Um, Co-founder and chief scientific officer of Taxa Genomics, which is a Manx company which provides DNA testing services to the environmental and the veter veterinary business. Um, Rachel's PhD is in computational biology, but um, by her own admission, she didn't know that when she was at school, she didn't really have those ambitions and um, was perhaps more reluctant as, a, as, a, as, a, as a, a, a student at school, but went on and found her passion, which is what's got her to, to, to the level and the, the, the expertise that she has today. Um, a couple of little bit of extra bits about Rachel. She's only here for a few more weeks because she's off representing the Isle of Man uh, in shooting at the Island Games, something that she's very, very good at. And also, those of you who are astute will remember that this talk was originally scheduled for January of this year, but we, we, we had to move it because arguably one of Rachel's greatest achievements occurred in February when she gave birth to Oliver. So um, congratulations on that front. But it also means that the, the typical sleep deprivation of a, a relatively new mum is present. I think <laughs> it was what yeah. you said, Rachel, <laughs> and um, uh, sort of a, a caveat, a warning that um, if, if the ramble starts, it's sleep deprivation, it's not lack of expertise, but I doubt that's going to happen. Tonight's talk um, is recorded, as they all are, and will be available in the not too distant future to listen again or for those who can't make it tonight to listen and watch for the first time. And the talk with no more ado, which I think is intriguing, um, which is kind of, uh, I think the original title we had is what's DNA ever done for me? Well, we're gonna find out a bit about that through an exploration of the implied DNA testing universe. Thank you, Dr. Rachel Glover. Hello, good evening everybody. Um, yes, I am sleep deprived and I do have coffee. So please you know, accept <laughs> that I will be drinking coffee throughout the presentation. Um, it's one of the great things about Zoom. You wouldn't get that at the front of the lecture hall, that's for sure. Um, so what I'm going to talk about tonight is about all of the different things that we can use DNA for and the ways in which we've, um, I suppose over the last 20 years, exploited DNA testing to the world's advantage really. Um, and quite a lot of those things uh, most people are not aware of. Um, so to start you all off, I've got a little bit about what DNA is and nucleic acids. So nucleic acids comprise of two things. So there's DNA and there's RNA. And DNA is double-stranded. So there's two strands of it which have the complementary letters. A always pairs with T and G always pairs with C. RNA is a code again, but it's a single stranded molecule. So there's no pairing of them. And you can see that T is replaced with U. But the molecules are very similar and the codes that are in DNA can actually be read into RNA. So if we were producing a protein, for example, what happens is that this process of, of transcription happens. So the, the gene is read on the DNA, by an enzyme which produces RNA of those instructions. And then this thing called translation happens, which turns this code into amino acids that fold up into a protein. So that's how DNA becomes enzymes and proteins in your body or in any other process, so for bacteria, for example, um, and how those are, are produced from the DNA code originally. So, some of you might have already heard of DNA testing and the things that it can be used for. And what I was hoping was that you might be able to pop into the chat box to kind of say what you already know that you've you've seen DNA testing used for. Um, and I'm going to have to have a look here and see if I can see the. Yeah, so we've got crime scenes, ancestry. Any others? 
it's a bit tricky sense. sometimes you have to navigate the zoom to get the chat box <laughs> yeah where ancient relatives came from genetic diseases yeah so that's pretty good that's about what i predicted people would come up with yeah dog breeds yeah that's for sure <laughs> um okay cool so i'm going to start with what we kind of had up at the top there so you've got crime scenes so ancestry and relatives is also paternity testing so you're kind of jeremy kyle who's the daddy kind of um type uh applications these are cause these are, are tests that use the dna sequences that we have in us and that we inherit from our parents to produce a unique profile for, for um, identifying us, just like a fingerprint. And what these come from is something called a short tandem repeat, or we also call them a microsatellite. Um, and you can see on here, I wouldn't worry too much about this on the left-hand side, but what you can see on the right-hand side is a piece of DNA. And you can see this really repetitive region here. And so a short tandem repeat is just a short piece of DNA that gets repeated and repeated over and over again. And what we do is we count the number of repeats. So these happen in, in regions where the numbers of repeats can vary between people. And so you might inherit 12 copies from mum and 14 copies from dad. And so you end up with two different numbers, which can then be used to identify you for that particular repeat region. And often these tests have anywhere from 10 to 30 different little microsatellites that are each individually tested. And what that does is it produces an overall DNA profile for that individual and it's unique to that person. Obviously, if you're a twin, that can cause issues, but that's where fingerprints come in because fingerprints are actually different between twins. So, uh here is like what it actually looks like so for us in the lab you get these different sizes of dna and that's what these are here these are the number of letters of dna in each of these little uh, microsatellite regions and we end up with lots of different colors lots of different sizes and that's that's what a dna profile actually really looks like in real life this is often what it looks like once it's been processed and it's been um, visualized and the results have been um, produced by a lab so this is a DNA profile of a male, because you've got X and Y down here, but you can see that a lot of these different uh, sections, there's two numbers, and one of these will have been inherited, been inherited from mum, one will have been inherited from dad, and that makes it unique to that person. And you can see here, this one, both um, were the same that were inherited from the parents. So what that does is that, we can look at each of these individually and they all have a statistical number attached to them to come up with an overall profile and say, OK, well, this person is definitely the father of this child with a 99.9% .9 probability. And you can also exclude um, potential fathers from that. On the forensic side of things, obviously, you're picking up DNA from an environment There can be mixed profiles in that. So maybe there's one or two or three people in a particular DNA profile. And there's a whole load of statistical tools that are used to um, kind of split up the DNA profiles that might be in a mixed sample. But typically, if you're looking at paternity, you have mouth swabs, it's a very pure sample. And often in forensics, it's one, one perpetrator that has left their DNA behind. So that's one application of, of DNA testing. The other one that did come up in the chat box, which is, again, um, we've got inherited diseases and traits. So the DNA sequence that we look at, so this says cat, 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 but the DNA sequence that we see codes, and that's what the, the genetic code is. Every three letters code for a different amino acid, and each of those amino acids then get chained together to produce that 3D protein. What we end up with here is that if when your DNA is copied, so cells divide, but all of the DNA in those cells has to be copied and duplicated first, the enzymes that do that can sometimes make a mistake, and it's a bit like a transcription error. So if you were given a document to type up, you might make a typo somewhere in that while you're, you're retyping it into the computer, for example. And that's what happens with DNA. So you can end up with a little change. So here, that should have been an A, but it's been changed to a C during the copying process. 
And that's changed the amino acid that goes into that protein. And what that can do is it can change the shape of the protein. And if it changes the shape of the protein, that changes the way that that protein or that enzyme does its job. So a really good example of this is cystic fibrosis, where a one letter change like that changes the shape of an enzyme, which then changes the way that that enzyme works to make it less effective. So patients with cystic fibrosis end up with a buildup of mucus in their body, um, and they can end up with digestive issues absorbing uh, nutrients as well, all from a one letter change that changes the shape of one protein. On the flip side of that, we've also got changes where it's not a one letter change, it's a one letter deletion or an insertion of a letter. So here you can see then A has managed to get kind of copied in. So you've got yet another typo, but this time it's added a letter in and that again has changed it in a different way. So it's the same position in the genome that the letter is changed, but it's changed in a slightly different way. Um, and it can have significantly different effects on the overall individual. So it's not, not unlike billions and billions of letters, but only one letter changes and everything is drastically different. The advantage to being able to test for these kind of things, so if you imagine um, cystic fibrosis again, if you have two parents who are both carrying the cystic fibrosis mutation, because we all have two copies of our DNA, one um, chromosome, each we have two pair, two chromosomes per pair. There we go, there's sleep deprivation coming in. Um, if we have um, two copies of something like the cystic fibrosis mutation, then that means that we get cystic fibrosis from birth. Um, but we can have one copy of it and it doesn't affect us in any way, shape or form, but we carry the mutation, which means that we can pass it on to our children. So in finding out that you're a cystic fibrosis carrier, you can actually also find out from your partner if they're a carrier and then predict whether you're going to um, have children with cystic fibrosis. So in families where they know that um, the trait can be carried, they can test before they have children or um go through IVF, for example, to test embryos prior to putting them back. Um, so there is advantages um, to doing that. There's also disadvantages too. Um, okay, so this is another um, more visual representation of what happens when one letter changes in a genome. This is the dog genome, and it's a gene called MLPH, which is responsible for the black coloration in their fur. Um, this one letter change here, so in a black dog, it's a G at this location. But in the blue colouring or grey, it's a kind of diluted colour, it's an A. And that's literally one letter change over about 3 billion, I think, in the dog genome that gives you the difference between a black dog and a grey dog. So it's, it's almost like the printer's run out of ink. And that's literally just the very last letter in this gene that changes. And it changes the shape of the protein completely, which changes the colour of the coat. So it's a really nice example to see exactly what can happen. So the human genome, um, I don't know if you, um, if like me, when I was, well, I was year 13 at school in 1999, and there was a lot of fanfare around then about the, the human genome and how it was going to change everything. And then I think in 2001, there was a huge announcement that they'd finished the human genome. And then about every three or four years since then, they've finished the human genome again. Um, and what that's mean, meaning really is that they haven't really finished it each time. It's more that they get a better copy of it, a more finished copy. So I think it's really that the definition of what finished constitutes has changed over the last 20 years. Um, and you can see here, this thing called, ignore this overlap layout consensus stuff. What you've got here is how we actually sequence and get the full um, you know, 3 billion letters in the right order because we can't at the moment sequence it from one end to the other. So we can't take like a spool of wool, we can't take one end of a chromosome, feed it into a machine until it gets to the other end of the chromosome and just read it um, like a book. We have to actually chop the DNA up into lots of smaller pieces and sequence those smaller pieces and then put them all back together again, a bit like a jigsaw, putting them back on the, the top of the jigsaw box. But what we do is we make sure that we've got plenty of copies of it so that we're not getting it wrong. 
we're not kind of putting the wrong jigsaw piece in the wrong place. And that's what this diagram is showing. You're basically chopping up the DNA, we sequence it all, and then we computationally lay them all back on top of each other and find out where the overlaps are to give this one final sequence. So what's happened over the years is the technologies have improved and that's resulted in better kind of finished genomes as the technologies get better and better. So there is a technology called um, Oxford Nanopore at the moment. Um, it started coming out in about 2014. In the last two or three years, they've really hit their stride. Um, to say that this company is the apple of biology would not be an understatement. They had their initial public offering um, on the stock market a couple of years ago, and I think it was $8 billion. It was a huge company. Um, and what their technology does is that it sequences very long pieces of DNA, which is very different from the way that we've been sequencing DNA over the last 20 years. Um, and their technology is getting used now for something called telomere to telomere sequencing or T to T. And what that does is that it literally does take that spool of wool chromosome and feed it through a nanopore. And the hope is over the next few years that we really will be able to just sequence one end of DNA straight the way through to the end without having to chop it up first. Um, and that would be you know, really incredible. It's starting to come about now. So the other thing to note with the human genome is that when you talk about there being one human genome, well, that's a one human genome from one person. And there's 8 billion people on the planet and we're all a little bit different. We all look a bit different. We all have different health risks. We all have different heights, different weights. Um, it, we've inherited different genes from our parents. So there's no single human genome. And what science is, is really starting to, to take notice of is that we really need diversity and representation in the, the human genomes that are available for research. Um, a really good example of that is that there's some known uh, mutations um, in women for polycystic ovary syndrome, but the research that um, contributed to the um, discovery of those mutations was only carried out in Asian individuals. So we don't really know what, what those impact of those same mutations in Caucasian individuals are, for example. So in having a really um, broad reach of genomes, um, it makes research far more representative and the results of genome research um, far more useful to everybody as a whole. Um, so this is one that I don't think came up on the chat box. Um, certainly one that I know about, um, having just had baby. Um, but there's this thing now called non-invasive prenatal testing or NIPT testing. Um, and what that does is that it basically replaces um, a amniocentesis of old time. Um, so amniocentesis has um, quite a high risk of miscarriage and a few other things. But obviously, if you've got... Um, high risk pregnancy anyway, you can have um, this NIPT test. It's basically just a blood test. And what happens is that when you're pregnant, some of the baby's DNA is actually released into your own blood stream. And it's something that we call CF DNA. It's called cell-free DNA. Um, and it's DNA that uh, migrates through the placenta into the mother's bloodstream, and it can be isolated for this type of testing. Um, and so you can find out um, a really good statistical analysis of whether your baby is likely to have Down syndrome, Edwards syndrome or Patau syndrome um, at a very early point without having the risk to you or the pregnancy um, at all. It's just a simple blood, blood test rather than having to go for amniocentesis. So that's been um, really revolutionary. Obviously, on the consumer genetics side of things, um, you can now basically get a blood test that will tell you the sex of the baby far earlier than um, a scan would have. Um, so give you a little personal anecdote there. Um, me being me, I did a NIPT test at 10 weeks, found out that I was having a boy via DNA testing. Didn't believe it because I know what can go wrong in DNA testing labs. Um, at my 12 week scan, I asked them, you know, oh, what do you think I'm having? And they said, oh, well, you know, obviously we can't really tell you, but mm, and I said, well, I've done this DNA test and it looks like it might be a boy. And they went, yeah, yeah, that kind of matches. But they don't want to commit at that, that stage. And at 20 weeks, I didn't tell them that I'd had a blood test done. I just kind of went for the prediction and they went boy. And I'm like, right, I've had a blood test and two scans. I think I can believe this now. Um, and it was right. So, <laughs> um, so 
but that's you know consumer genetics that's now a huge business finding out um early gender results um next slide okay so this has led the NIPT testing has led on to kind of bringing in these latest technologies and what um a company called Illumina and the NHS side of things called Genomics England are doing is they're running a huge research project over the next um, few years to sequence the whole genomes of newborns in the UK. And what that means um, in the short term is that rare diseases will be picked up extremely quickly for those newborns if they have any kind of chromosomal abnormalities that might not have been picked up traditionally until they had developmental delays as a toddler or even later. Um, now those will be picked up um, within a few months of birth, depending on how quickly this testing happens. Um, the other side of that is that for the life of those children and as they become adults, they'll be able to correlate back to the genome sequence. So I said before that the cells in your body divide and the DNA is copied over time. The DNA that you're born with, um, you will accumulate mutations over your lifetime. And it's the accumulation of those mutations over your lifetime and the impact of those that cause things like cancer in very localized areas. So cancer, for example, is mutations that have accumulated in the genetic and molecular machinery that copy the cells. So the cell copying mechanism gets out of control, it goes super fast, and that's what creates tumors. Um, but that means you've only collected, in some cases, you've only kind of accumulated that mutation in that one place. So being able to create this kind of lifetime resource where they can follow those children through life and, you know, resequence their DNA as they get older and find out their risks of, of various disorders as we do more and more research. Um, I think that's going to be really interesting. Um, obviously, there's a whole ethics side of it. You know, you have to give consent, but um, it's going to be interesting to see how that, that plays out even over the next... 20, 30, 40 years. Okay, so consumer genetics. This is probably where some of you have, have guessed as well. You have your ancestry DNA, um, you've got your inherited disorders that we've already talked about, but you can actually get those tested without having to see a doctor. Um, you don't have to, to go and make an appointment with anybody these days to get tested for the most common inherited disorders. You can actually order a test off the internet from a company called 23andMe or um, decode genetics, spit in a tube, send it off, and you'll find out what your genetic risks are for those disorders. Um, you have your ancestry as well. There are companies that will sell you a little testing machine uh, or sequence your genome or sequence your DNA, and then give you a meal plan for what, you know, based on, on your predicted risk of whether you're likely to um, need less or more calories during the day. Um, because of that, and because of the sheer amount of companies and tests uh, that are coming onto the market in recent years, you have to be quite careful about who you buy them from. Um, so, for example, the company that does meal testing and tells you whether you should be buying green vegetables or red vegetables that day um, is not particularly great science that it's based upon. Um, but their website and et cetera, et cetera, will all look exactly, you know, as snazzy as 23andMe or Ancestry DNA. Um, so there's there's a, not a lot of regulation in this market at the moment. And um, it's going to be interesting, again, to see where that goes over the next few years. Um, so when I say that some variants are less so, it's really kind of, you know, do you want a company telling you that you should be eating green vegetables on a Friday because of your DNA, um, where, where that link is not particularly um, strong? But on the same side of things, you might have some company like 23andMe who's able to tell you whether you're a cystic fibrosis carrier and the research that's underpinning that result is incredibly robust. So you just have to be a little bit careful about who you buy tests from. The thing to actually note on this, the reason why I've put the lady spitting into the tube down here, human testing is very specific. So for example, my lab does um, veterinary and environmental testing mostly. We can just send out a cheek swab and, you know, the, the sample comes back. But if a human testing company sends out a cheek swab, there's the chance that a person could be swabbed without their consent. So, for example, um, somebody being swabbed in their sleep, just, you know, insert into the cheek. 
It's very, very difficult to sample somebody else if you have to spit into a tube for 20 minutes. So there's no real experimental reason as to why you have to spit into a tube as opposed to just put a cotton bud in your mouth. It's all just to do with consent and the way in which the samples are taken to make sure that you've actually consented to that testing happening. OK, so um, I did 23andMe about oh, 13 years ago now, just as the company was um, getting set up. Um, they were actually targeting people like me, scientists who worked in the field. Um, we all got free testing if we just paid for the postage and that kind of thing. But this is my ancestry composition, and it does match our family tree pretty well. Um, so I have a um, surname of Glover. Our Glovers all came from Warrington. 100 years ago and then settled in Williston <laughs> and um you know kind of there it's shown up pretty much I'm going to say that these genetics here are from my Glover side um I have a Scottish granny um who admittedly there were six generations of the family in Okdamukti but I'm going to suggest that some of the DNA there is is from a, sam a person that was sampled in Glasgow and then my mum was from Ireland and Admittedly, she was from Northern Ireland, but there's a lot of people, obviously, who've been tested in the rest of Ireland and then must have shared relatives, you know, a few generations back. So it's not surprising either that large cities have got um, kind of shared DNA with my ancestry because people tend to gravitate towards cities for work, etc. Um, but yeah, I am apparently 99.7% British and Irish. Um, there you go. Um, I think when I originally got this done, there was some Scandinavian in there, but I think over the years they've, they've honed their, their testing a little bit more. Okay, so this um, is another application of the way that we can use DNA, um, and it's something called genomic epidemiology. And what you're looking at here is um, a study from 2012, I think, where there were, um, it was one of the first times that this type of um, approach was used and it was in a, a hospital neonatal intensive care unit. They had MRSA um, bacteremia, they were, um, had very, very sick babies and they didn't know where it was coming from because it kept coming back. They would uh, clean the place down, they would um, decolonize uh, their staff, their patients and it just kept coming back and they didn't know where from. And so the genomic epidemiology was able to link all of the cases and link all of the um, genomes together to actually, and when they sw swabbed the staff, it turned out that it was one member of staff that was colonized with MRSA that completely unintentionally, um, you know, had no idea that they, they were MRSA positive, was actually infecting uh, the babies on the unit. And so that person got treatment, that person was decolonized um, of M MRSA with antibiotics and um, bacterial antibacterial washes, um, and their outbreak of MRSA on this unit stopped. So it's a real kind of applied technique um, that can be used. Uh, the other side of it was that you know, kind of 10 years on, it was used in um, COVID, which is probably one that you've all heard of more. Um, and what that means is that you can actually use the DNA in the virus, or RNA in this case, um, to track the progression of infections from person to person. So RNA and DNA, as I've said before, are very similar molecules. Um, DNA actually has a proofreading capability. So when um, that DNA is being copied um, from cell to cell, it's proofread. So if it makes a mistake, it often goes back and catches the mistakes, whereas RNA doesn't have any proofreading ability. So when it makes mistakes, they stay. So RNA viruses, for example, accumulate mistakes far faster than DNA viruses or DNA in our cells, for example. So that's how in COVID, um, we were able to see that high resolution um, epidemiology because the virus was an RNA virus and it's quite a big RNA virus and it accumulated mutations between people as well. So um, it's quite an interesting thing. What you can see here um, is some actual data from the Isle of Man. Um, so this is open access data. This is data that um, I retrieved from the um, what's called COG UK database. Um, it's open access and it's actually from the first week of infections on the Isle of Man. So we never know when we have open access data who these people are. 
Um, there's no information about who the people are at all. But what you can see is that there's little clusters um, together. So for example, there, there's a cluster there. There's another cluster down here, another one here. Um, and those are the groups of people that are living in the same household, I would expect, or were at the same party, or you know, were infected in the same place by the same individual. And this is how we can use this information. You'll see down here, there's a number attached to how long these branches of the tree are um, to be able to reconstruct transmission chains and say, okay, you know, this person most likely and with such X, you know, X amount of probability gave um, or transmitted the virus to this person who transmitted it to this person who transmitted it to this person, for example. Um, so, this is a bit more um, of my background. So this is species identification. Um, DNA can be used in a lot of different ways. So if you can imagine uh, buying fish, for example, especially kind of white fish, it's very difficult to tell what species of fish it is from the fish counter in Tesco, for example, um, or any other kind of um, outlet. The problem with um, things that look the same is that you can often get fraud and it can happen at any point in the food chain. It can happen from the point at which that fish is caught. It could be switched out and, and um, described as something else. It can go all the way through to the point at which it's in a restaurant where you're being sold um, sea bass, for example, and paying a premium for that sea bass, but actually you've got some cod or some haddock or some whiting or something like that. So food fraud comes in lots of different ways and for lots of different people in the food chain, um, it can be a problem and DNA testing can actually tell us exactly what species that is, even if it's at the point where it has been cooked. So I'll give you an example. Um, back when I worked in the UK at the Food Environment Research Agency, a colleague of mine went for lunch at the um, Curry House a couple of miles up the road um, and came back with a napkin with some chicken in it. Um, or it was actually, no, I think it wasn't chicken. It was um, king prawn. Um, so they ordered a king prawn curry. Um, when they ate the curry, they were a bit suspicious that it wasn't king prawn that they were eating. And they had a look and it looked like king prawn. It had the little pink line, everything. It looked like king prawn. But they actually brought it back to the lab um, and we tested it. And it turned out to be reconstituted chicken that had been shaped into to king prawn um, and even painted with the little pink line to make it look like a prawn. And then obviously sold to... Um, the curry house as king prawn. Um, so you can get a lot of different food frauds in that. Um, bird strikes are probably one that people don't think of that DNA testing can be used for. Um, but if you look at the plane at the bottom there, bird strikes can be a real problem, especially at major airports. If you have populations and flocks of birds um, around the airfield, you have to manage those very carefully because the last thing you want is a large flock of geese, for example, who are resident on the airfield who uh, fly up and go through the engines of planes. Um, and so when bird strikes do happen at an airport, what we can do is actually take a sample of the blood or feather or tissue that's left over from that strike, find out what species of bird it is that's hit the, the plane, because often there's not very much left of the bird to, to figure it out by, by looking at it. Um, and that informs the airport to know what species they really should be managing around their airport. Um, and seeing if they can bring in predators, for example, that will scare certain species of birds off so that they have less of a bird strike problem. Um, bird strikes can be responsible for plane crashes. So it's, it's really quite a serious issue. Um, species identification can be used for forensics. So for things like bushmeat, illegal bushmeat being brought into the country, um, even ivory. Um, there are certain species of tree that are illegal to transport across borders as well. Um, so being able to identify carvings um, and those kind of things to the exact species of tree that they're made from, they could be passed off as something that's not illegal when actually it is um, an illegal uh, wood. Um, pest control and biosecurity. Um, this is quite important actually for climate change at the moment. So as, um, as we're finding out in the last couple of days, as the climate gets warmer, um, what happens is that certain pests and diseases um, for crops that may have traditionally been in northern Africa, southern Europe, are actually coming closer and closer to northern Europe 
and causing problems in crops that they weren't before. So DNA testing can identify when we've got uh, quarantine species that we're not expecting to be present um, in and around that crop, for example. Um, a lot of these invertebrate pests transmit viruses that can decimate wheat crops, for example. So the last thing we want is, um, for a food security point of view, is wheat crops being decimated by um, pests that, that those crops are not used to being exposed to. Um, local authorities, so uh, this is things like bats. Um, Great Crested Newt is a big thing in the UK um, because of planning regulations. Um, they're protected, both species are protected, uh, both organisms are protected um, and you have to have a license to uh, move them and to, to uh, build, for example, when there's bats present. So you need to know what species of bat you're dealing with to be able to do that. And previously, what would have happened is if somebody wants to build an extension or convert a barn, for example, and they suspect that there are bats there and they'd have to hire an ecologist to come in overnight and use an echolocator to actually determine what species of bats were present. Whereas now what can happen is that the uh, builder can just collect some bat droppings and send them off to a lab and find out. Um, it's a lot cheaper than hiring an ecologist um, overnight with an echolocator. Um, the other side of that is biodiversity and conservation. So you might want to know whether the management, crop management things that you're putting in place or the um, uh, conservation, um, strategies that you're putting in place are actually having an effect and DNA testing can be used to look at all of the different species in that ecosystem and find out whether it's changing over time. Um, this is what I call species identification 2.0 but we actually call it meta barcoding um, and what it means is that the previous things that I talked about were all about identifying one thing so you have a smear of blood on the side of a plane that you, you're pretty sure has come from one bird you identify that bird through DNA barcoding and DNA testing and you know what's there but the techniques that we use for that don't really work when you have a mixed sample so say there was two species of bird both of which got pulverized by a jet engine you still need to be able to identify what those two species are and we use a different genetic technique known as meta barcoding for that and it just means that we can look at any kind of sample and elucidate exactly what species are in that sample and what proportions of that species are there as well. Um, so looking at this, going back to the food fraud, here you've got kind of like, well, what, what exactly is in a vegetable stock cube? Um, are the species, are the, the types of tea that are in my, my blend actually what it says on the, the side of the tube? Um, a, a more kind of school related example that we've done in the past is um, to show this technique to, to kids and university students is what's in a flipper dipper. Um, so if you've ever gone into a um, supermarket, go into the freezer section, you'll find something called flipper dippers. They're like the fish equivalent of a chicken nugget. But it's really kind of what fish is in there. Is it one type of fish? Is it two types of fish? Ten types of fish? Is it the, the offcuts of various types of fish? Um, and you can actually work out the composition of fish that's in those samples. It's quite a nice example. Um, so that's incredibly useful and it's getting more and more useful um, and that's using these new technologies um, like Oxford Nanopore. Um, so a good example of that is something called water quality testing. Um, most people have heard of water quality testing. Um, usually though it's kind of how much E. coli is on the beach or how much E. coli is in a river water to you know from runoff from fields for example and traditionally they're used um, to just grow the bacteria and see how much of it's there. So is it a safe amount of E. coli or not? What's happened in the last few years, um, and this was a big project that I worked on in the UK before I moved back to the Isle of Man, is that um, the Environment Agency in the UK feeds into something called the Water Quality Framework. Um, and there's a, a directive, an EU directive in that, which um, splits rivers and waterways and lakes into one of five quality standards. So you can see there's a quality index on the end here. So they're either very good, good, moderate, poor or bad. And one of the bioindicators that's used to determine whether a waterway is um, in a particular quality index is diatoms. So diatoms tend to sit um, on rocks in the, the bottom of a river. They are a um, very, very diverse group of organisms. Some of them really, really, really love a bit of raw sewage. Um, and what the Environment Agency wanted to do was basically try and see whether they could determine whether 
um, the water quality in certain areas was changing because of uh, water companies discharging sewage into waterways and into rivers um, and then claiming that they hadn't at a later date. So what this technique does is it collects the uh, diatoms from the bottom of the river. It uses this metabarcoding technique to determine the exact quantity and um, volume of um, or proportion of uh, diatom species in that sample and then relate that to a database that we know um, relates to the water quality um, standards. And what this happened, what this means is that if the diatoms change in a river course, it's not going to happen overnight, it's not going to happen um, during one period that sewage has overrun into that river. The proportion of different species of diatoms in a river change over time. It takes a lot of sewage running into a river over a long period of time to begin to bloom the, the type of kind of diatoms, which are kind of algae really, to produce a poor or bad quality index. So it's quite a useful thing for the, the governments to use to uh, try and pin down um, what companies are telling them versus what the science actually says. Um, so I mentioned cancer earlier on before, um, and I mentioned with the NIPT testing, the neonatal uh, testing, is that we have something called cell-free DNA, which is CF DNA. Well, cancer detection uses something called CT DNA, which is circulating tumor DNA. So just like we can find DNA in the environment, we can also find, and you can find DNA from the baby in the mother, you can also find the specific cancer tumor DNA that is mutated and different from um, the person who has the cancer's DNA floating around in their bloodstream too. So what this means is that there's the potential at the moment for a single blood test to effectively screen you for various cancers and find them before you start getting symptoms, before you have to have a scan to try and find it um, and actually point you in the right direction. At the moment, they're quite uh, early on the, in this kind of testing. It's, it can, it's more that, uh, I guess, the, the detection of cancer with DNA is more kind of what kind of type of cancer it is or what subtype of a particular cancer it is. So what this can do is if, uh, let's say, a tumour is sent to the laboratory for analysis, DNA testing can be used to say, OK, this is definitely a liver cancer tumour. OK, we found that in the brain. So actually it's a metastasis as opposed to it being a brain tumour. Um, so there's that side of it. But actually this, this single blood test is being... Um, called, I, I suppose, you know, quite rightly, the holy grail of, of DNA testing, the holy grail of, of cancer testing, because you want a one-off test that can tell you today whether you have cancer, that you can repeat that test in six months and find out if, if you have anything to be worried about. Um, and there is a company called Grail who is actually doing this testing. <laughs> um, it's huge. It's not one of these fly-by-night companies. It's an absolutely massive company. They've got huge investment. Um, but they're basically looking at the different fingerprints of different cancer tumours and being able to find those in the, blood, uh, the DNA that's floating around in the blood that's been released from the tumour um, and actually being able to pinpoint what type of cancer somebody has long before they actually have symptoms to find the tumour. Um, that is everything. Um, hopefully I've managed to fit that into 45 minutes I have. Um, so it's Time for any questions, if anybody has them. It's been a bit of a whistle-stop tour, to be honest. Well, uh, you definitely win the prize of being spot on with your time management. <laughs> Excuse me, Rachel. Um, I've always got lots of questions, but just checking out there if anyone uh, in the chat or wants to turn their mic on and um, ask. Um, I'll certainly get the ball rolling. I, I just, I know you said that some of those consumer uh, that list of consumer use usage was was varied um, in terms of its reliability. But I just wondered whether the meal testing, what you should eat for your DNA, was actually just a, a gimmick or something that, with more research, is a real thing. Um, it might be. I think. Um, I mean, I suppose if you promise not to tell on the company for me. Um, basically, the company is called DNA. Um, nudge and they have they have a shop in Covent Garden you can walk in and buy the little testing machine that tests 
your DNA and tells you what kind of foods you should be eating. The problem is that it's based on quite loose science. So, you know, sometimes these companies are set up. Um, I don't know whether this is the case of DNA Nudge, but sometimes um, the companies are set up on the basis of one academic research paper, which isn't a lot of background really to set up a whole testing or a whole company based on that test. Um, DNA Nudge, for example, um, became known as DNA Fudge during COVID um, because of their little testing machine, perhaps not so much during the science that's based on their food testing, but they were trying to pivot into COVID testing um, because they saw it as a money-making thing that could, they could transfer their machine. Um, but there are quite a few of these kind of companies and they just spring up. Sometimes they're spun out of academic labs. Um, universities at the moment are very keen on spin out companies um, from their research. Um, and you do get quite a lot of companies that are almost fly by night, but then you also get some real kind of serious companies that come out with similar types of research. And it just, you know, maybe the right marketing, the right, the right research within the company to build upon the initial, initial science. Which, which kind of leads into um, two of our two of our listeners at exactly the same time ask the same question, which is basically, what do you? What's the future? You know, the crystal ball of of um, future genetic testing and DNA research in terms of its application. Yeah, it's quite scary how far it could be used, to be honest. So when I talked about the diatom testing, there, there's a whole side of environmental testing where you're just pulling DNA that has been shed from various species out of water. Um, so you don't even have to kind of scrape diatoms off a rock. You can literally just filter a few litres of water and then actually get the species composition of anything out of that filter. So, um, and that, that's capable of doing it now. I keep threatening to go down and do Peel Beach, um, you know, find out exactly what bacteria are knocking around in that water now versus what will happen down the line um, once they put the sewage treatment in. Um, and it, it's, if you can get DNA out of, blood that isn't the DNA of um, the person, so DNA of the baby or DNA of the tumour that, that's growing in them, and you can get DNA um, from water and you can get DNA from surfaces, you really don't need very much of it these days because the techniques are just so sensitive. So I've been talking to you for what almost an hour. My DNA will be all over the screen, all over my desk. Somebody could come along with a swab, take my DNA and the amount of DNA that they would get with one swab right now would be enough to sequence my entire genome. So we're almost getting into Gattaca territory. If anybody knows the film, there's a, a film called Gattaca. It was released in the 90s um, where everybody could get this genome sequenced and you could find out like your potential boyfriend or girlfriend's genome sequence by taking some of their hair to the commercial laboratory and find out if they were a good match, that kind of thing. You know, careers decided upon based on DNA. And I don't think we're going to go that far. But the technology now exists to do that. And that's that's a real ethical consideration, um, especially with the consumer genetics. You have to be quite careful as to what you're giving them permission for when you spit in that tube. <laughs> yeah, well, absolutely. I mean, uh, there's a couple of questions come in, but I, I, I mean, thank you, Sarah, for saying you enjoyed the talk. We don't have any clever questions. Well, I don't have any clever questions, but I did, I did have the observation of the nightmare scenario of, of advanced AI getting hold of DNA resequencing and... Um, oh, we, yeah, we know, kind of just, it's a um, real apoc apocalyptic. <laughs> <laughs> if I'm honest, most scientists are using AI at the moment to write their websites or to write things in, in better mm -hmm. English than they would write their papers typically. Um, you know, chat GPT is, is definitely changing things um, in that way. But I think a lot of scientists also know the limitations of those kind of AIs more than, than other people. But Probably. AI and machine learning has been used for quite a number of years with DNA testing. So those yeah. um, uh, phylogenetic trees, for example, do use machine learning to an extent to kind of model how things um, work out one way or the other. Um, so it's, it's an extrapolation, but it will be interesting to see where it goes. There's a question from Lonnie about what are the biggest issues in genetic testing? Would this limit the use of genetic testing? I'm just thinking about the Grail company. Do you think it would be cost effective? Uh, I think it probably would be. I don't think with Grail, it doesn't just always come down to cost either. So, you know, you might say that a $2 million treatment for a rare genetic disease isn't cost effective, but it will be produced and there will be people who it will be very useful for, even though it's not cost effective. Um, 
with grail if you can imagine catching a cancer early enough that it can be removed in a simple operation without chemotherapy before it's gotten to an advanced stage then that's saving the nhs an extraordinary amount of money if you can imagine a cancer being caught at stage one versus stage four um, so that's you know the the monetary side of that but then there's also um the, the personal side of that is that, you know, those people are not going to have to go through more aggressive treatment that they might have done had their cancer been detected six months earlier or a year earlier, for example. Um, so it's going to be really interesting. I think ethics is going to come into it um, in a fairly big way. Um, Grail has some, um, at the moment, Grail and, and the big company that produces the sequencing machines, which is Illumina, are basically the same company. And there's quite a lot going on um, on the business side of things about trying to separate those two companies out because obviously Illumina has a very big vested interest in using the technology that they make to do this kind of testing. And if it was, uh, you know, released into the NHS, for example, you can imagine how many tests would happen just in one year in one country versus, you know, the rest of the world as well. So. Um, yeah, some of the issues there. There's, it's quite multifaceted, some of the issues, and some of the issues we may not even be aware of yet. That's, you know. Which, which is, you know, captured in the question in the chat about is ethics keeping up? Um, I would imagine. Uh, oh, good question. Struggle, um, struggling. <laughs> yeah, I think a lot of it, certainly with consumer genetics, is put back towards the individual for them to check the terms and conditions that they're agreeing to. So when I I uh, signed up for 23 and me 13 years ago and sent them some spit in a tube. I knew that I was signing up to have my DNA um, potentially sequenced down the line and potentially used for research to find new mutations. You know, I get a questionnaire every so often, you know, have you been diagnosed with anything? You know, do you like broccoli? Do you like asparagus? All of, all of those type of things so that they can try and make co correlations over millions and millions of people. Um, but you know that you're signing up for that. I think sometimes with the um, newer or um, more fly-by-night companies, you might not know what you're signing up for and they might be biobanking your sample without you knowing it. Um, but you have to be really careful and read the terms and conditions when you're handing over um, a, a bit of yourself, really, um, to a commercial company. Mm -hmm. Absolutely, absolutely. Um, I, 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 again, this is at risk of sounding shallow. It just that you know, the, the question about ethics is fascinating because it's just seen we're living in a period of incredible um, developments in very, you know, AI and in, in, in DNA and whatever. And we really do need to keep perhaps give more time and attention to the ethics of just because we can do something, should we? And and how should how should we how should we do it? So it's a yeah. I mean, that's the, the health is. Mm. There is a huge example of that um, from China where um, there's basically a worldwide ban on modification of human embryos. So you, you can use gene editing these days um, in various ways. Um, and the best point, theoretically, if say if you had an embryo that was testing positive for cystic fibrosis and you have that one letter that just needs to be changed back to the correct letter for that person, you still have a completely unique individual, but ultimately they will grow up without the CSR, um, the cystic fibrosis mutation and grow up healthy in that regard. The best point at which to do that is when the embryo is in the first stages, in the first couple of weeks, in a Petri dish, in an IVF lab, for example. Um, the ethics then say at the moment, no, that doesn't happen. We don't know what the long-term consequences are of modifications. So there's, um, you can kind of, uh, modify DNA in that way with something called CRISPR um, and because we don't know what the long-term effects of that could be there's this worldwide ban and unfortunately a scientist in China decided that they were going to do it anyway and they did and they brought um, babies to term that had been genome edited and that scientist received um, I think a, a ban of some kind they were all of their funding was removed. They've obviously got a worldwide reputation that nobody will touch with them with a barge pole um, for employment, for example. But equally, there's a couple of babies that have been genome edited and nobody knows what's going to happen in their lives, whether there's knock on consequences of that scientist potentially targeting one letter change. But what happens if it cha also changed a letter a million bases away in something that could be crucial in that person as they grow up? 
And so that's the stuff that we don't know yet. And that the ethics is in some kind, some ways clear cut and in other ways very murky because how do you stop people doing something like that if they've got the ability to do so and the rest of the world is saying no you shouldn't do that and they go and do it anyway and it's yeah it's mm. difficult how do you police it it's yeah. all, all murky murky world yes. oh my gosh okay if any more questions or comments i think um i think um Yes, it was fascinating and scary as, as, as there's a comment there, and it is a, 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 a quite overwhelming. It's not even Halloween. Hey? <laughs> it's not even Halloween. <laughs> it's extraordinary, extraordinary stuff. Um, thank you so much, Rachel, for, um, I mean, one of these people, when, when you speak and when, and when you talk, the, the, the depth of your knowledge and your, your, your perspectives and your expertise is, is is, is just fantastic and we really appreciate the time you've taken to put the presentation together and to share just a bit of all that expertise with us um, and, and you do it very well you do it in a way that, that the, the Luddite the, the, the non-expert can can, can uh, get intrigued yeah. and engaged with so really really appreciate that as mm -hmm. I say this is recorded and, and as all our UCM talks are, are on the um, uh, UCM website this will be on in shortly um, this is the last of the series and we'll be starting again in October for the 23-24 academic year. But um, what I do want to just remind people is, of course, that uh, I haven't done that very well, what I've just tried to do. You know, we have got our annual research festival coming up um, on the 13th of October. This is, I can't believe this, this is this is now our, our fifth year um, of, of the research festival and, and it's just getting bigger uh, and more eclectic and more interesting every year. So that from UCM is our next uh, event, public event. Uh, there'll be information on the website soon around how you can register. It, it doesn't cost you anything. And the program is shaping up very well already. Um, definitely something for everyone on the, on the program again this year which is which is the intent of that show so that's 13th of October which is a Friday at the UCM campus for the fifth uh, annual UCM research festival um that's it as I say there's three hours of sunshine and blue sky and, wa and warm air out there to enjoy and um thank you Rachel thank you for those who are attending and um hopefully see you all soon take care